All right, here we go. Another episode of Knicks Fan TV, the podcast, CP from Knicks Fan TV. Tonight's guest, he served as an NBA executive for a number of years, starting off in the league office, ultimately with the Philadelphia 76ers in a player development role, and most recently as the assistant GM of the Sacramento Kings. He also played professionally for a number of years. His name is Brandon Williams. Brandon, how you doing tonight, man? Thanks for joining us. CP, appreciate you having me on, man. Looking forward to our talk. Thank, thanks again. And you know what? The, the, the NBA has kicked off on the restart, but for the Knicks, it's uh, they're looking at about another nine months without basketball, man. And, and once again with the Knicks, it's a new regime, a new president of the basketball operations, and a new coach. Uh, so let's start there with the coach. You know, the Knicks yeah. made it official with Tom Thibodeau. What did you think about the Thibodeau hire? Well, man, look, first, uh, I got to say, I, I'm a Tibbs fan. Uh, he's, a, he's a true blue basketball man, smart basketball man, has paid his dues uh, for a lot of us that, uh, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a younger guy in this league. So, you know, I've, I've been in positions where I've looked up to these guys. Uh, you know, the Knicks have had a couple of good runs over the last 20 years. One of them, you know, I think was uh, with Woody and the Mellow years. Um, but the other one was with Jeff Van Gundy as the head coach and, and Tom Thibodeau on that staff. Um, and so I think it means a lot to have a guy that knows New York, uh, that knows the market, uh, but also going to bring the kind of grit and, and determination that the market is looking for. So good hire, good basketball man, and, and paid his dues to be here. You know, I thought that was important, too, in that hire, having somebody that understands the atmosphere. This is a tough place to play. It's the heaviest jersey in the league to wear. And, you know, some of the fan base wanted a more younger, upstart coach, but I kind of felt like this situation with the, with the rebuilding team, I thought Thibodeau was, was a good hire. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, um, it, it's tough when you're rebuilding because uh, as a front office, or actually from ownership, you think a lot about, the timing, you know, the time is important. You know, how, how long before you think you'll be relevant, before you're ready to strike? You know, this team has tried in a number of ways, you know, new new start, guys that are new to the role. Uh, even though it's going to take this group some time, I, I think it's less about fit finding your way and more somebody that can establish a culture, establish. Uh, I mean, he's been successful in, in all of his previous stops. So I think he brings, he's able to shorten the curve uh, for the organization, shorten it for, um, a lot of the staff, because he knows what he's doing, now he's just got to learn the players. You got to learn these guys and start to get them to buy in. And he got to find the right pieces that fit. What do you think about some of the knocks on Tibbs? You know, the, the knocks on Tibbs from the naysayers yeah. are, are pretty common, whether it's can his system, you know, adapt to today's game? How will he handle the younger player? You know, he's known to be kind of gruff. And it will he be, um, you know, as easygoing on, on some of the younger players, load management, so on and so yeah, forth. What yeah. do you think about some of those knocks? Yeah, and what do you think yeah. he'll need to adjust and, and to be successful here? Yeah, man. Well, on a couple on a couple levels. First, I don't know too many players. I mean, dating back to when I played and, and I had a, a hobo career at, at best. But, you know, I've been around a lot of great players, been a lot of situations. And I just don't remember a lot of players complaining about playing, you know, about playing minutes. The best players want to be in the game. It's actually hard to get them out. So th that's number one. Uh, in terms of taking care of their bodies, I think that Tibbs is, is, is smart enough to not drive his players past a breaking point. Uh, I think that he's trying to play guys, uh, give them opportunity to grow and develop. He didn't have a very deep roster in his last stop. And so you try to play to win. I mean, those guys are competitive. They play the bulk of the minutes, they play to win. I think one of the things that, that might be helpful, and I'm sure he's learned it a little bit, is uh, having a staff that he trusts and being able to delegate. You know, I've heard a conversation about, about Woody possibly coming back, and that could be important because he's been a, a real relationship forward coach, uh, being able to build relationships with stars. You, you always need sort of like somebody in the law might say, uh, you know, there's the velvet glove with the iron fist and the velvet glove. I mean, you got to be heavy handed at times, but you also need the smooth approach. And I think having the right staff to help him out there is going to be important. But I don't know if there's so much change in style completely. I mean, look, he's been around for a long time. He is who he is. He's going to be demanding. Uh, he's going to put pressure on these guys, but I think that's also really what they want. It's time to get out of the gutter and, and step up. Everybody wants to be at that at the high level. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you mentioned Woodson and, and his um, ability in terms of player relationships. We interviewed Jamal Crawford, Rasheed Wallace, Kenyon Martin, Raymond Felton, who have all played for Woodson at some point. And they all said the same thing, you know, a guy that's going to hold them accountable, but also uh, someone that they respect because he played the game and someone who knows how to deal with the players and have a good relationship. So as you said, it could yeah. be a good balance with Woodson and Thibodeau in terms of kind of Woodson being that, you know, that branch between the players and the head coach. Right, right. Well, you know, I had a – he's he's had a number of stops. I mean, think about, uh, you know, just this time, they both have been with Doc Rivers, which I think is important, bridge, bridging the gap. Sometimes as head coaches, it's good to step back and see how other guys do it, why they've been successful. I think that's one of the things that I'm learning now is uh, when you get time away is really study. Uh, you, we never stop being students of the game. Uh, the two of those guys with their own particular philosophies – have also had a chance to be coached by other good coaches. They'll bring it together. If, if that's the marriage, you know, I don't know. That's, that's still for, uh, for Leon Rose to determine. But there, there's speculation, and, and it's at least a very strong candidate. Now, Leon Rose is also new on the job. What do you think his experience as a longtime agent, how do you think that will help him uh, being on the other side of the table now as president of basketball operations? Yeah, right. You know, um, you know, I know Leon to be a, a no nonsense, um, you know, no frills kind of guy. I mean, he's had high level uh, players on his roster, uh, which means that he knows how to recruit. So he knows how to say the things. He knows how to attract the guys. But he's not one to blow a lot of smoke. If you get him in a room, um, as we've had to negotiate and talk about a, a client list and, and who might be the right fit, I never got to feel that he was like the used car salesman who's trying to upsell you or you know, trying to change your beliefs. It's about really a meeting of the minds. What is it that you think? Here's what I believe. Here's why this could be, you know, the right fit both, both ways. And if we don't agree, move on. I mean, he, he doesn't have a lot of time to waste. He's just been a real no nonsense, tell it like it is guy. And I think that's uh, something that the Knicks fan base will appreciate and certainly a staff. Uh, time will tell, you know, when you get into the teeth of the job, there's so many different components. Uh, and very few people, any of us, come to the job um, ready to do it all. Uh, you got to take your time with it. I think we got to give him time. But the good news is that he's taken this role, going into a hiatus. Uh, there's been nothing but time uh, outside of the pressure games and playoff runs. I mean, he's able to do this, talk, get to know his staff, um, and then make determinations about who fits and, and, and who doesn't. But I, I believe his no-nonsense approach is really going to be the thing and look, he, he surrounded himself with great basketball minds, you know, guys that hit the ground running in personnel, relationship building. Uh, and one of the key aspects is the relationships with college coaches, particularly when you want to get the draft right. Intel driven, you really want to know the guys when you couldn't be there. And so having those relationships in, on college campuses, I think, is going to be really important. He's done that well. Another factor on his team is World Wide West. And when you speak about those relationships, it seems like that's Wes's calling card. What's your experience been like with Wes? What, what could you tell us tell us about him? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you, we all said there are lots of skills that we all work to perfect, right? And uh, some of that is just work in the room. Uh, knowing, knowing who to talk to for how long, knowing the right people to get to, to influence and, and get decisions made. Um, I mean, he's been, uh, I guess, you know, you count him a maven in his space. And he's been doing it for a long time. So he, he brings value. You know, a lot of this is going to be just learning the ins and outs, X's and O's of operations and administration, you know, in the NBA environment. That, that is, you know, significant. But uh, coming with a skill set, the ability to sit down at the table. And, and the truth is, with so many of our guys, and I say our guys, players, uh, players, their families, their friends, their circles, they, they want people who could talk to them straight, you know, talk to them straight. Uh, everybody's not going to be a superstar, but everybody has a chance to be impactful in, in some way if you get in the right fit. And so I think being able to tell them that, tell them when they're right, tell them when they're wrong is going to be important. I think that's something that Wes does well. Another topic of debate amongst the Knicks is player development. 
You know, they brought in Craig Robinson last year as as the player development guru. He's no longer here. Uh, we later find out that there was a bit of contention between himself and Scott Perry in terms of how to best utilize the G League for some of the younger players that weren't getting as much minutes last year because of the influx of veterans. You know, you have guys like a, a Kevin Knox, a Dennis Smith Jr., Frank Nielakina, whose development has been somewhat stagnant to very little progress being made. Now, Tom Thibodeau has come in and said he would embrace the G League as, a, as an option to get younger players some more playing time if they're not getting burned with him. And that even he would even consider bringing in um, player development coaches, extra personnel, just to focus on the player development side of the house. Um, for someone like you that has had player development experience, what do you think are some of the key components to an effective program? Well, CP, you know, when I left the league office, uh, my first role was uh, GM of a, of the Delaware 87ers, which is the Philly, uh, the, the Sixers uh, minor league program, our affiliate. And um, I got to tell you, there's no one size fits all. There's no one right way to do it. It depends on, you know, the, the timeline of the team and how many developed projects there are and injuries and so many things factor in. But, you know, to kind of cut to it, uh, Think about a lot of these young guys that are getting drafted that uh, haven't even had a chance to go through an off season. So if you come in as a freshman, you sort of play right away, you get to training with your team. And then in the spring, you sort of dip off and start getting ready for the draft. They, they haven't had a chance to really put together a development program, like what it is I need to work on, how, how many times a week or how many, how many hours a day um, will it be in this location, that location? I mean, they're sort of juggling a lot of, a lot of things getting down to the nitty gritty really of like, how do I get better? Uh, before you really have to have expectations for them to grow as NBA players, they got to figure out how it is that they train themselves. You know, so many different pieces, their bodies, nutrition, and so forth. Um, if you are lucky enough to have a program that's solid and you're working on, you're able to establish a rotation, guys know their roles, and then you introduce young players to that mix who aren't going to get a lot of time. That's sort of the easiest thing. It's like, okay, so we, we, we know who we are. We're a team that's competing. These guys, while we drafted them and maybe even drafted them high, aren't ready to impact us where we are. Let's get them burned minutes in the G League. That's, that's perfect. Less confusing. Everybody gets it. Starts to get a little funky when, you know, there's an injury or get into the season and a player's not quite performing. Maybe you think uh, maybe we need to move this player. Maybe it's time now that we see that we're not as competitive as we thought that we can start to get the young guys some time on the floor. Um, I think the Knicks have been, you know, more recently in a place where they can't take their young players and fully commit them to, to G League, you know, uh, G League minutes. Uh, they're, they're, they haven't been good enough to justify not playing these players and, you know, sort of getting them experience, you know, um, in game live experience and games that matter when people are, when, when the focus is on them. Uh, but, but I do know that if you can buy them time, look, they're all 19, 20 years old. There are very few players that are ready to impact the league is use it as a development tool and make sure that those coaches are on the same page. You know, you can't really have two staffs. You got to have one staff. Just the G league is an extension of the staff mm -hmm. embrace them. They got to be around. They got to be involved in all the meetings so if they know philosophically what you're trying to get out of each of the players, that's where you get the most bang out of your buck when, you, when you're assigning them or, or they're spending time on two-way. A, lo a lot of people point to the Raptor system as, you know, that, that model of success, right? You look at they had six players in the NBA Finals that had stints with the 905 Raptors G League team. Yeah, but yeah. When you look at guys like Siakam, like Van Fleet, those were – later round picks or even undrafted players that, you know, they were able to groom and, and move up to the main roster with the Knicks. And you look at a DSJ, you look at a Frank Nilekino or a Kevin Knox. I mean, these are all lottery picks. Do you think there's a bit of difficulty there or from an organizational standpoint um, in terms of sending down a lottery pick to the G league? Maybe it's viewed as a demotion or something or something like that. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know, that's that's fair. And, and I think the narrative has kind of been shifting. The, the more you can see names like, you know, Siakam and, and Gobert, you know, who, who've been in the G League, that you you got to chip away at that. And I think that's important organizationally to do because, yeah, it's, you know, G League is now, you know, a, a little bit older. When I was at the league office, that was something we were fighting all the time, talking to GMs about why you should invest and in, why you should really focus on this and be one of the teams on the frontier. Uh, to, to go and do it well. 
But I think at this stage, there, there's so many good players that, that have spent time, top draft picks. Um, I think you got to balance that too with the pressures of your individual market. You know, uh, Knicks traded, um, you know, a franchise level player away and brought some guys in. And I'm sure, you know, uh, the marketability of those players is important. Their game is important. The fans are locked in. Like we, we gave away something. So let's see these guys and what they're able to deliver. And that, you know, alone sort of keeps guys from being assigned. We want to see them on the main, on the varsity floor. Uh, but you got to take each situation, you know, and, and try to logically think through. The big question is how do you get these guys better? You know, wh- where do they get better and where to get better fastest? This is a pressure cooker situation. Now, <laughs> yeah. Rose and Tibbs have kind of put it out there that this team is is looking at R.J. Barrett and Mitchell Robinson as as their two pillars. When you look at this upcoming draft and some of the free agent classes that are coming in next offseason, who, who's maybe a draft pick and, and a free agent that you feel like you can pair with these guys that can kind of help them uh, move the needle? Well, you know, that, that's a tough one because the market is so wide open. I, I would say, you know, strategically, though, uh, when you're in a position like the Knicks and, you know, if, uh, just as a front office friend, it's think about all your options. You may lock into you may want to lock into some cornerstones. You know, they're young, uh, but you still have to think about their value and what they might be able to return. I believe that uh, you never cut off options. You know, you want as many as possible because you, you're trying to maximize the, the opportunity to deal you know you don't want people calling and, and saying well we know you won't do this so let's only talk about this sliver of things like no let's talk about all of it in the end we may not do it but let's talk about all of it um you know my big questions i think you you raised a couple i mean you know dennis smith jr you know what about kevin knox you know high level guys or high level picks young players that i think we all you know expected to maybe do a little more than they've done to this point in their career but there's still a lot of room ahead of them. Uh, in order to do anything in free agency or do anything in a draft, you need those guys to be valuable. Uh, they, they're either valuable in terms of hitting shots and doing things for you on the court, or they're valuable in trade. So as much as you may lock into these two pieces, you got to think about you know the other guys that might be able to return something for you. There are going to be a number of picks available. Uh, I think the Knicks may be projected around eight. Uh, maybe you get lucky and, and, and win the lottery and move up. Because there are a couple of tiers of player. I mean, you sort of have the, you know, I don't know, franchise changing is maybe too much pressure on young guys. But you sort of got an elite crop of a couple of guys, I think, that hit the ground running uh, their rookie year in the NBA. And then another crop that I think going to fit in and might take some time to develop. And in that crop, you know, you, you got to figure out, like, what's going to be there for you. And if you don't like it, be prepared to trade. You got to think a lot about maybe the guy that we get is down the road. Uh, we want to turn one draft pick into two or three chances. So, um, you know, it's, it's less about locking into the exact player and think about options. It's very interesting. Now, in terms of building, you worked for the 76ers organization, as you said, from 2013 and 2017. Uh, part of that, you were the GM of the Delaware 87, 87ers. Now, that time period was also kind of dubbed as the the process. You know, Sam Hinkie's brainchild yeah. his path to to success but along those three yeah. seasons you know philly went 47 and 199 in three seasons 27 trades the wheel and the dealing in the end they come out with two cornerstone pieces in ben simmons and joel Embiid, and a, a team that's hovering around the top of the east when you reflect back on that time would you dub the process a, a success you know, uh, like a lot of things, you got to look back over time. Um, that was really tough. Those years are really tough. I know you're tough on Sam. They're tough on the organization. Uh, no one right way to skin a cat, right? Um, I think if we could do it over, and a lot of us think this way, if you could do it over, maybe there were a couple of things he might do differently. But the goal was to, to try to come up with those franchise cornerstones. Uh, there are a lot of shortcuts to the middle but there are no shortcuts to the top you know and, and as much as um, your uh, the Knicks franchise and market and fan base wants to see something happen very quickly I think you know every smart person knows that it won't happen overnight you know it may happen quicker if we get good if we get lucky you get good health uh, maybe some of the young guys hit really quickly and you get a couple veteran guys that get intrigued uh, but with Philly you know you were building from sort of a, a you know, mediocre middle of the road place. 
uh, took taking a step back to then take some steps forward. Um, I'd imagine that everybody that's now talking about the Sixers as, um, you know, a possible contender and being uh, one of the top teams in the East. And I mean, they're probably underperforming. I think they'd admit that they're underperforming this year, but they've got a team that's got a chance to be good for a long time. You know, they, they, so was it a success? Not yet until you see the chip, but it's moved along. It's much more competitive and they're within striking distance. And I think that's what everybody wants is a chance to really be competing at the highest level. And they got that. So. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, since then we've seen the, the draft uh, odds evened out at the top three. So certainly Knicks fans want to, don't want to thank Hinky for that. And, and uh, we, we were the worst team last year, went in for the Zion sweepstakes, you know, missed out on Zion and Jabba, got RJ. So, you know, hopefully a little bit of luck comes our way in in this next draft. But so speaking of the draft, you know, take me inside what it's like to be in a war room. Like, you know, I'm trying to envision yeah. what a Knicks war room would be like with a new president of basketball operations, Leon Rose. You have an established advanced scout and Walt Perrin. You have Scott Perry, uh, who's also been in the game for 20 years. You have West, you have, you know, your, your advanced scouts and so on. W- what's that like being inside a war room and, and coming to a consensus on one prospect to pick? CP, by the time you get to, to draft night, I mean, um, it's sort of the climax of a lot of work over, you know, months and months. I don't know if there's ever really a start, you know, this year at least to next year and so forth. Um, but the first thing you want to have, you want to have trust in that room. You want to know that everybody there has done their job uh, to the best of their ability. It's hard to bat a thousand, uh, but you lean on your scouts to know the prospects uh, on a whim. A deal's made in Minnesota that somewhat surprises you. Maybe they moved off their pick. Maybe there's a player available now that you didn't think would be there. Uh, you might want to refresh your thoughts. It could be that uh, a team proposes a trade, you know, suddenly. they We constantly are talking trade in the days leading up to the draft. Would you do? Would you consider? You know, what if we did this? But all of a sudden on draft night, you know, just, just new nerves, new anxieties. They're new proposals. And you got to be able to go to your guys in that room and say, you know, how, how can we pull this together really quickly? Talk about it. Think about it because the clock is on. So, you know, aside from like, you know, you got the draft coverage on a screen, you've got prospect profiles and you got Twitter, you know, like what's the news that might give you an edge and thinking down the road, you got to be able to zero in on the most important things, which are we're trying to get the right pieces to move our franchise forward. Uh, I would imagine you know, I know each of those guys separately. I don't know them all together, but the fact that they're all pros and know their particular areas, they've, they've been around for years, coming together with the information is not going to be the hard thing. Uh, it, it's just the, when you have slightly different opinions, you know, ultimately can, will they move quickly and fall in behind, you know, Leon's direction? I imagine so because they're doing, doing well to this point. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see what they come out with. Uh, now, as your stint with uh, the Sacramento Kings as the assistant GM, as I said, you had taken over for Scott Perry. Now, in the 2018 draft, you guys went with Marvin Bagley with the number two pick over Luka Doncic. What did you remember was the the thought process behind going uh, Bagley over Doncic at that time? Well, you know, I'll just I'll say, CP, that, you know, in this business, you know, still another phrase. I mean, you, you wish you could get a mulligan from time to time. Um, you know, that, that was a draft. It was really interesting because there was a lot of high-level talent. When you think about, you know, Luca and, you know, DeAndre Ayton, Marvin Bagley, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr., Trey Young, uh, even Mo Bamba. You know, there was, there was a lot of discussion. I mean, you know, I, I hate to draw the line there, but, you know, just a lot of guys circulating in that top area of the draft that a lot of people felt, each could have been number one. Um, what it, what it, you know, sort of a lesson learned, you know, you, you always look at that and it's easy to Monday morning quarterback and like, ah, if I had known them what I know now, of course, you know, maybe we think about it differently. But, you know, when you think about your process, do you have all the information that you need to feel really comfortable making a decision? You know, there, there, it, there's still challenges for a lot of organizations and in their international scouting. You know, we spend a lot of resources on the college campuses and, uh, going to the Kentucky Pro Days and, and so forth. And, um, and and there's still gaps and holes in our international understanding 
uh, as much as our international coverage. So, you know, that's that's the fish that that, that got away. Um, but you know, as every franchise, you know, has to, you, you have to, you have to pivot. Um, you know, you, there are, there are lots of ways to put together championship caliber teams. Um, you, you got to get good players, but you also got to be really lucky and, and keep them injury free. So, um, you know, the, the, the process is very much about, you know, assembling the right information and, and you still learn that there's some gaps in, in the things that we know and the things that we were able to accumulate. But uh, learn from it and, and keep moving. Get better the next time. Now, Harry Giles was a player that the Kings had selected in the previous draft. They've since declined his player option, and he'll be set to be a, a free agent this offseason. Some Knicks fans could, could see him in an orange and blue uniform. What do you think Harry Giles can bring to a team? That's interesting. You know, um, first of all, i just say, you know, uh, Harry Giles is a, a wonderful human being. You know, having a chance to to be alongside him and, and his year, we talked a lot about his um, his process because I've been through a little bit of that in in Philly. You know, with players having to set out the season, it's really hard on them emotionally. Um, I think they get it physically that they're not ready to sort of run and jump and attack the rim the way uh, they had. But you know, emotionally to be part of something, but just off to the side. Uh, all the extra rehab, all the extra work, but it also tells you a lot about his character and his personality. I mean, they had a severe injuries on both knees. A guy that was a high flyer uh, has had to adapt and change his game some. He's not, he doesn't have the lift that he used to have, but, you know, has a high basketball IQ, has amazing hands, uh, the ability to pass the ball. Um, you, you, you can see flashes of Weber, you know, in, in the way that he sucked the ball up and, and, and made plays and had vision. Uh, I don't think he'd be a high-level scorer. You know, that's, that's not necessarily the, the role that, that's found him. But uh, he's he's learned to be a contributor, and and I like to see him continuing to grow. So you know, look, if Knicks fans, you know, like Harry Giles, there, there are lots of reasons to do that. Yeah, and and as you said, his, his passing ability is certainly one that that um, jumps off the charts with me. Uh, certainly, at the athleticism and and the uh, the knack for rim protection. Um, certainly stands out as well. So very, very interesting prospect is, is Harry Giles and uh, had some interesting games in the restart and limited minutes. So he's certainly yeah. uh, trying to improve his, his free agency stock for sure. You know, I know that um, you also got to remember, you know, it's a tough situation to be in when you're betting on on health. And, you know, I, I wasn't a part of the process, don't want to dissect the process. Uh, but, you know, making a decision about that that last year, you know, in a four year deal, um, you know, you need your players to be healthy. You know, you, you want, uh, you know, and you want the right fit. It could be that, you know, that it's not the perfect fit. But that young man is a talent um, and he's very charismatic and actually changes. He, he affects the temperature of a locker room and of a bench. So many great things happen around him that you know, I'm pulling for him and looking for him to have success. You know, whether that's with the Kings or, or wherever that is in the NBA, he, he certainly has shown he belongs. Interesting indeed. Um, now, your time with the Kings, you know, you, you came in in, in uh, 2017. Uh, by the end of the 2018 season, uh, you had been uh, dismissed in, in your role as, as assistant GM. You know, many had speculated that there was a rift between you and, and Coach Dave Yeager in terms of the direction of the team. Uh, what can you say about that tenure with Sacramento and, and why do you feel like it ended in the way that it did? Uh, you know, CP, I, you know, out of respect to, you know, everybody involved, I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, it's disappointing, you know, less, there are a lot of lessons learned in that whole situation and, and really every stop, but uh, disappointing that, you know, it wound up being characterized that way as a, a rift or something between, you know, me and a coach, you know, I was a, um, you know, certainly part of the process, but a cog in the wheel. And, and I do know that, along the way, there's so many challenges to doing this, whether it's basketball, football, baseball, anything at the high level, um, you know, we're going to have different differences of opinion and there's going to be some frustrations, there are tensions. Uh, but, you know, maybe the biggest, you know, lesson learned is, is that it all can't ha happen quickly. You know, sometimes, you know, the pressure and the anxiety of, of, of wanting to perform and, and wanting things to go well and, and really wanting to uh, sort of develop chemistry quickly, you know, for all of us to agree quickly you know, that, that can uh, put a lot of pressure in a negative way on, on an organization. But, you know, I, uh, I really respect the uh, coach. And in fact, you know, we share a bit of history that, that you know, was never talked about. And, uh, you know, the end of my career, you know, we won a championship together, 
you know, in the CBA. And uh, so I've always respected them as a basketball mind, a basketball coach. And, you know, like as, as players and coaches and, you know, coaches in front office, you know, there are arguments and disagreements. Uh, just hate to see the narrative take off the way it was. But uh, the lesson learned is, you know, we've got to get better at, at managing the pressures of building from the bottom. You know, th- those are always tough for, for, for everybody. I saw it in Philly and saw it in Sacramento. And uh, just keep growing and getting better from it. Hopefully you can rebound from that situation. And, and as you mentioned, you know, building from the bottom, it seems like they, there's always a rift between, you know, management and, and coach, especially here with the Knicks. I mean, we're, we're looking at eight head coaches in as many years. So hopefully, you know, that relationship with, with Thibodeau and Leon Rose um, will, you know, l- lead to some sort of stability and, and help lay the foundation for sure. Yeah, one thing is for sure is, you know, it sounds like they're off to right uh, to, to a good start because it starts with alignment, you know, with ownership, you know, with management and the coach. You know, you know if there's anything that, that a lot of us who've been through uh, these types of breaks have learned is don't rush, to, don't rush to start. You know, there's a saying in sports, like it ain't about how you start, it's how you finish. And that's not totally true. It's very much about how you start. I mean, you got to start strong, got to finish strong. Mm-hmm. But the way you start, taking time to, to, to do the little things, like to really develop the early seeds of chemistry, a vision, and talk about how it is you want to approach this challenge, because it's going to be a real one. I mean, it's tough. When you look at how strong the East is for you guys, you know, as Knicks fans, uh, there's, there's no quick way to knock the Greek freak off, you know, or Toronto or, or Philly that's got a head start. Uh, Boston, they're, they're real teams that are going to be good for – for a number of foreseeable years. So uh, don't rush the process early when you're building chemistry. you got to build alignment. That's important before you get into the strategies and tactics. And those are lessons that a lot of us have learned. Absolutely. And I hope it's, it's uh, you know, something that the man at the top, Mr. Mr. James Dolan, will, will uh, you know, take heed of and, and not rush this thing. So hopefully uh, it'll lead to, to, to eventual success for the Knicks. But, um, you know, speaking of the Knicks, you actually played in the league for a couple of years, a, a cup of coffee, as you said, a hobo career, as you said yeah. earlier. Uh, one of those stops was with the San Antonio Spurs, man. I see back there in the background uh, uh, Spurs number 11 with the NBA Finals patch on there. Uh, what do you remember about that run with the Spurs in, in 98 and 99? Yeah, man, that, that's, that's going back to a great time in my life, you know, uh, as a young man. Um, you know, my, my career, I like saying I was a hobo because I had a lot of stops, you know, some were NBA, some were minor leagues, a lot overseas. I loved the game and I chased it. You know, I just wanted to I wanted to be the best player I could be and be a part of the best situation. Uh, when I got to the Spurs, um, you know, to be around guys like David Robinson, to see him passing the torch to Timmy. Uh, Timmy being this shy guy. I mean, I played against Tim in college at Wake Forest and see him emerge as a superstar. I mean, the kind of guy that would, you could build a, a program around and, and he supported a dynasty, um, the leadership of Avery Johnson, Mario Ellie, you know, Sean Elliott, that was a, a storied year for him, you know, battling sickness and, you know, all the threes that, that he hit. I mean, Steve Kerr's on that, on the team. I mean, as a young 23 year old kid, my job was to to learn in the background from those guys and support them. I mean, we knocked heads and I banged them and I did what I had to do in practice. I, I learned how to be a pro. Um, I think it really supported, you know, everything I did, I did later in my, in my career, you know, you really get to see how greatness is built. Um, and well before coach Popovich was just pop, uh, you know, he was great. You know, he was, he was coach Greg Popovich and, uh, seeing how he developed, all this stuff took time. And that's kind of shaped my mind for, you know, how things don't happen overnight. You got to be ready to stick with it, start something and then finish something. And, and uh, I, I learned that a lot in that 98-99 season. Well, unfortunately, it came at the expense of a, of a Knicks team. <laughs> Short, we were shorthanded, Brandon. You know, we didn't have the yeah, captain. Yeah, yeah, the captain were. Patrick Hugh was banged yeah, up. Were. LJ, you know, yeah, LJ you had, a, had a debilitated knee injury. But, yeah. uh you know, I, I think as as Knicks fans, once we got to that point, we knew we really had no chance. But I think this, the city was just proud, obviously, coming from an eight seed up, beating Miami, our arch rivals, 8-1 eight, eight seed, you know, and, and the LJ four-point play. It was a Cinderella run for sure. But yeah, once we yeah. ran into the Twin Towers, we, we knew it wasn't going to be an easy feat. Man, that year we lost two games. 
I mean, look, I turned I turned into a fan, you know, just like everybody else. I think once conference finals, you know, started, mm-hmm. there's no more practices. Uh, that team's just sort of rolling. I, I remember us losing two games that entire playoff run. One one was to Minnesota uh, when KG was just more of a man than I've ever seen anybody, and he just decided to take a game from David and Tim. Uh, the other was to the Knicks. So to to your credit of of, of uh, this sort of amazing run of lots of sweeps uh minnesota got a game and so did new york but uh, I, I really feel like and i think you know the guys talked about it and you're happy to be a part of winning and you don't care how it comes you know you, we did the work we, we deserve to win but it's nice to see you, you want to play against guys at their best and, and we knew that next team was a little hobbled it would have been good to see big pat uh lj uh on that floor you know we think the outcome's still the same uh but maybe not for one you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, Spreewell, Spreewell brought that heart and soul and, and Houston was, they were fire and ice, man. And, and, uh, yeah, you know, I remember yeah. Spreewell averaging like 26 points a game, Houston 24. So they, they did their best, but, yeah, uh, congratulations yeah. to you, man. Winning an NBA championship must've been a great feeling for sure. Well, I enjoy wearing my suit during the whole run. You can believe that. And I pulled out something different every game. <laughs> Had to look fresh at MSG, man. The bright yeah. lights are on you, even, yeah. even on the bench, man. Yeah, yeah, but I understand. You know, look, it, it's those experiences that you know I really felt like would help me. Uh, you know, because you know this is a tough, it's a tough road for for our, uh, for our players. You know, eighty-two games and then you know four series. That's really what you want. You, you know, you got to do the right thing. You got to eat the right way. You got to take care of your body. And and remember, the competition isn't the guy you see in front of you every day in practice. It's somebody out there who might be working harder. That next man up. a little bit of temp chemistry something that's happening somewhere else you can't see that might take you out and so you got to perform be ready to perform every day it's a hard lesson but you know something important i take from my career um and try to share with young guys like look i may never be i was never as good as a lot of the guys that i have to draft or work with or scout Mm. but uh one thing i know for sure is this life as a player and how fragile it is you know uh, how how fragile is really for all of us executives scouts so forth so um amazing experience you know, it was great to be around winning, be around winners. Did Did you sign a contract with the Knicks in um, the next year or, or 2000? Yeah. yeah, you know, I, ironically, that so that's the next year. That was the next year after uh, San Antonio. And it, as crazy as life is, you know, I was uh, on a CBA team. I finished that, that next year on the CBA team. Uh, we went to, I was a ninth seed, much like the bubble had to play the A seed to play into the playoffs. Mm. We won and then went on this crazy run to the finals. Um, I think because of that, there was a little bit of attention. I was, you know, always a guy that was sort of on the cusp of getting called up anyway. And, uh, but, but I didn't get called up during the regular season. The season's over. I go home and just kind of starting to ace my knees down and get ready for an off season, kind of catch my breath. I get a call from the Knicks and I, I can't remember who was injured at that time, but you know, they're like, look, we've got a few games left. Uh, come in, kind of learn what we're doing, and then we're going on a playoff run. Now, remember, this is back-to-back years. I think mm-hmm. they were in the finals the year before. Now we're they're expecting to go on a little run. And uh, as it would be, you know, I'm talking to Coach Van Gundy, I, I think, in a hotel, and he's like, look, we, you know, somebody gave me the word that we can't even do this. Like, you're not even eligible <laughs> for the playoffs. Because <laughs> I think earlier in the year, I was um, – earlier in the year, I played for the Hawks. And I've been released. And so there's some rule I, I signed after a certain deadline. And so I wasn't eligible for the playoffs. So, um, you know, another another story in my, you know, my long, you know, kind of crazy book. But um, I enjoyed it. One thing's for sure is just the, the days of being around Coach Van Gundy and Tibbs at that time and, mm. and Allen um, and seeing like the perfection with which they worked. And I still remember it's been years and I've known, gotten to know Jeff in other ways, but there's certain things I learned in just that week being on the floor with him mm. that I share with other guys. The importance of the pass and the pass being on time. When a great shooter like Allen Houston misses a shot, it's your fault as the passer. <laughs> and that kind of thing <laughs> sticks with you because it's important for every man to do their job as small as it is to help the next man be great. Um, so yeah, I didn't get a chance to. It's one of those things where I I know it existed, but for some reason it doesn't exist very many places on paper. Um, 
could have been a dream, but it's something I enjoy. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> another, another chapter in the book, man. When you write the <laughs> no book, you, you can put that in there. You know? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so listen, Brandon, th- this has been a, a great conversation. I, I definitely appreciate all the insights that you brought, especially from an, an executive standpoint. Um, what, what's next for you? What does the future hold for, for Brandon Williams? Well, you know, uh, if you get word, you let me know. I think, you know, right now this is uh, uncertain times. You know, I'm enjoying watching. uh, I'm actually enjoying just the league being back. I think a lot of us are biting our nails, Um, you know, seeing guys play. Hopefully they stay injury free. I'm seeing too many things happen early. So, man, I, you know, I I don't want to see guys going out because of the hiatus and maybe their body's not being ready. But, you know, for for me, I'm, um, I'm a basketball man and looking forward to getting back involved. You know, uh, when you get all of us go through it, you know, where you, you have some time away. And, and so I've tapped into mentors and uh, friends around the league, friends that are out of the league to advance my knowledge. You know, where are the places that I can get stronger and maybe be a value to, to uh, and be a good teammate to the next group. So looking forward to, you know, what our opportunity may come and taking advantage of the lessons learned uh, in ways that I hopefully will be better. Uh, than my most, you know, my most previous stop. So looking forward to getting back in. Hey, never stop learning, like you said. Well, hopefully you get back out there as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I definitely appreciate all the insights, man. Hopefully we can do it again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good luck to you. All right, Brandon Williams, you, you as well, man. Thanks again. Okay, man. All right, CP.